All right. Well, I wanted to thank you for those of you who are able to make it live and for those of you who are going to be watching this later. I did a blog post at the Logos Academic blog on Monday about Galatians 2.16 and some of the controversy um, surrounding that verse. And that was in the context of talking about the role of participles to background action. Um, but in order to really kind of get the a fuller picture of what's going on in that verse, we also need to take a look at restrictive constructions. And so the presentation we're going to be looking at is, is actually a, a workshop or a presentation I've given in workshops at SBL and other places. And we'll give you basically an overview. For those of you who've already read the Discourse Grammar of the Greek New Testament and the chapter on conjunctions and uh, counterpoint point sets, uh, this won't be anything new, but it's basically going to be a, just a quick overview. So when I talk about connectives as opposed to conjunctions, uh, we're looking at not just conjunctions themselves, but other words um, like prepositional phrases like diatuto and, and others that end up connecting two clauses or propositions together. Um, and what they do is they serve as instructions. Um, they're semantically empty in and of themselves, meaning that there's not meaning to them, but there's a function to them instead. They give directions, and they've been, from a discourse grammar standpoint, they've been selected by the author or writer, or, you know, from an inspiration standpoint, you'd say that um, looking at verbal plenary inspiration, again, looking at some uh, assigning meaning to the choice there, they've been selected by the author, editor, and, and what these connectives do um, conjunctions, prepositional phrases like diatuto or narrative tota, the adverbial, um, the uh, temporal adverb that functions like a conjunction, they constrain how we relate phrases and clauses together, meaning that they give us instructions and they limit compared to ascendatin or the absence of any kind of connective, they limit how we could understand those propositions. Um, and as we're working in English translations, oftentimes the um, translations can end up obscuring these obstructions based on how they're translated. And it's not that the translators have done a bad job, it's just simply that Greek is in English and you have mismatches, and the Galatians 2.16 passage is one of those places. So let's go ahead and dig into Galatians 2.16. I've got the SBL GNT text up at the very top. We've got the ESV and the NIV down below. And I've bolded the two things that we're going to focus on. Um, kind of thing one is how we render the, um, the participle here. You, you basically have a circumstantial participle clause that runs down um, through... Um, through the comma here, but then you also have aeon may, which is translated almost universally in the major translations as but. Uh, but for those of you who are uh, budding grammarians at home, aeon may and a may are, are nearly always translated as except. Um, they're exceptives, meaning it's, it's, it's a certain kind of restriction, um, but is a generic um, way of, of constraining things in English, but we could say it's unmarked or less restricted compared to aeon may in Greek, or except in English. Um, so what we're going to do is take a look at, at these two things and, and how that impacts uh, our reading of the passage, and then we'll move to questions after that. So let's begin with a little background on the connectives. Um, the translation, most English translation, English translators seem to be um, wanting a, a may and a on may here in Galatians 2.16 to be translated as Allah. So let's, um, Allah is generally translated as but or instead. Um, and, and it has two different effects depending on whether what precedes Allah is positive or whether it's negative. In a context where... Um, it's preceded by a positive proposition. Allah introduces something that corrects what precedes. So you had some set of of, uh, of of some kind that had the Y element, that what was introduced by Allah as not a part of that. And Allah introduces this thing that goes back and, and corrects and adds in a missing piece, where when it's preceded by a negative proposition of some kind. Most often it ends up replacing uh, what's introduced by Allah replaces. Let's take a look at some examples. So 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16. But set Christ apart 
as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense to anyone who asks for an account, um, for an accounting concerning the hope that is in you. That's this blanket statement that makes it sound like you can do whatever it takes to make that defense. Anything you want. The sky is the limit. Again, I'm embellishing. But the point is that Allah ends up restricting that. The, the restriction is that we, we need to make this defense with courtesy and respect. Um, so that's that's kind of the effect with a positive statement. Uh, reminds me of when my mom used to say, all right, you, have, you can do whatever you want while I'm gone. And then she'd say something like, only I want you to have the dishes done when I come home. Um, the only statement at the end restricted what sounded like a carte blanche thing to do whatever I wanted. Romans 12, 2 is an example of a negative um, proposition that precedes Allah. Do not be conformed to this age, Allah, instead, or um, rather, uh, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So here we see Allah is is taking something that was not a part of the preceding set, which is whatever you might do, uh, you know, to make the defense, uh, or instead of being conformed, you were doing this other thing, which is this being transformed. A may and a on may bring about a, a different kind of restri- uh, uh, constraint on what follows. Um, in most cases, a on may. A may are going to be referring to some set. Now the set can be introduced or activated by saying no one or none who do this or all or every, and it doesn't have to be a complete set. And this is something I I think I misstated in the grammar. Um, All you need is a set. And one of the ways you can create that set is using something like most. Uh, Most of the people were at the picnic except Steve, for instance. Um, that's still sufficient. And, and these, this principle about set membership, activating some kind of a set, um, w- would hold true in English as well. Um, so let's take a look at, at what Aeon May does. Basically what that does, Aeon May, since you've activated this set, A May and Aeon May are going to introduce some subset so no one could do this except this sub small subset. Everyone did this except the subset that didn't. Most of the people were there except for this subset. So again, this is not just Greek. This is how exceptive, uh, exceptions um, work in English as well. So now let's go back to the exception, the, the passage we're looking at in Galatians 2.16. So... Uh, This is a a screenshot of the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. For those of you who have read the Discourse Grammar of the Greek New Testament, there is a database, a New Testament database, that marks up all of the same features that you read about in the grammar. And there's also a propositional outline, so we'll take a look at that at the end. But let's let's drill down here on what's going on uh, and why there's a problem in Galatians 2.16. Again, we already said NIV, ESV, pretty much everyone translates uh, Aeon May here as as but. So why would you do that? Well, um, just read the ESV. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Now let's fill in the literal translation of except, except through faith in Christ. Why is that a problem? Well, it makes it sound like something other than faith in Christ plays a role in justification. Um, and for that reason, it, it's creating, some people have claimed that um, this is creating a, uh, a contradiction in Paul's, uh, in, in Paul's theology and his teaching. And James Dunn was one that, that promoted that. He, he was arguing in favor of, of an accept um, and and that he was essentially siding with Peter here, uh, but there's it, so th- one of the responses has been to claim that um, this isn't a normal exception. So if we were to take a look at um, an article by Debbie Hun, this is from Novum Testamentum 2007. You can see the information here. She's basically arguing uh, uh, with with a number of others, a number of good scholars claiming that um, what's actually happening here is that this is what's called a partial exception, that the entire proposition is not being accepted, but it's only, it's only the main, main proposition. Um, And, and 
essentially this is a grammatical category that's been created that I would say isn't isn't necessary, especially if we look at things from a linguistic standpoint and, and from a logical standpoint. So let's go on back to the, the passage. Um, what happens from a logical standpoint with this acceptive set? Um, in, in this case, a person, let, let's think about the, just the truth condition of the statement. Can a person be justified by works of the law if they have faith in Christ? And, and the answer would be yes. Because faith in Christ, we know, is the critical thing, um, the, the, the critical element in justification. But by mentioning works of the law, it creates the impression, it opens the door um, that works of the law play a role. But from a logical standpoint, there's actually something else going on. Paul has defined a group of people by including that mention of works of the law, people doing works of the law. And he says um, that, that no one is justified by works of the law. So now he's talking about the subset of people who are justified and it's those people who have faith in Christ. Now, the reason why this is such an uncomfortable statement is because we're missing the other subset of people, and it's those who don't have works of the law, people who are not doing works of the law. The question is, what about them? Do we need to be in this group on the left, the ones doing works of the law in order to be justified? And again, this is a rhetorical device that, that I believe Paul is using, because if we go back and read verse 15, um, and, and to get more context, Paul seems to be siding with the Judaizers and saying, uh, we, are, uh, we are Jews by nature and not from among the Gentile sinners. Um, so it, to me, it sounds like that's pandering to that, that audience. And then knowing as well this, so if you go back to the passage, um, using the participle knowing um, introduces what follows, verse 16a, the statement about works of the law plus faith leading to justification. What that does is it, it implicates that this is shared knowledge. This is no-brainer information that we can all agree upon. So um, if we have the participle be a main verb, then we end up having 16a being an, an equal statement with we also have believed. But circumstantial participles or these, these adverbial participle, uh, participial clauses that precede the main verb from a discourse standpoint have the effect of backgrounding the action, which makes it secondary. It prioritizes the information. And what this does is it says that this is just setting the stage. It's not the final word, which means we need to continue reading the balance of the clause before we can expect everything to be out on the table. And what that means then is by promoting idotes to a main verb status, it's creating the the sense that this should be a complete statement in and of itself, which is not the case. Paul is, is simply setting out um, in terms of kind of equations or the logic of his argument that works of the law plus faith do lead to justification, which is true. But the thing is, works of the law is a red herring. I could substitute drinking chocolate milk and make a truthful statement to say, no one is justified by drinking chocolate milk except by faith in Christ. And that's actually a true statement, but it makes drinking chocolate milk or wearing a pink tutu or reading my Bible every day or whatever I might fill in there potentially. And I don't mean to, to, to mock what Paul's doing, but the point is he's drawing people in and kind of leaving the door open on the potential role of works of the law so he can come in and slam the door before we ever get out of the, the, uh, the verse. So that's why we need to keep reading in verse 16 uh, and 16, 7, the henna clause or the in order that clause. And that's where you have um, Paul saying that um, in order that we'd be justified by faith and not by works of the law. So there from a, from a logical standpoint, we find out that faith without works of the law results in justification. And then we finally, we come down to the last clause in verse 16d, the haughty clause, because, and then Paul eliminates, so he's handled works plus faith and said that that leads to justification. 
Faith without works leads to justification. But what about works by themselves without faith? And that's what's handled in verse 16d. Because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So you have works of the law without justification or without faith um, does not result in justification. So the importance of respecting the participle is uh, the participial clause is backgrounded rather, regardless of how we translate it in English, that we're concerned about the exegetical point here. If, if we respect Paul's choice to use the participle and respect his choice to use an exception, we can see that uh, we don't need to, to do special pleading to a, a limited acceptive or a, a partial exception, because I believe here Paul intended to, to rattle people's cage and make it sound as though he was claiming this, but then he went through logically and made very clear statements in the balance of the verse to show that faith without works gets it done, but but that works without faith does not get it done. So even though he's left the door open, he slammed it shut twice. Um, and I believe that that's, that's on purpose to have drawn in the Judaizers and made clear that this does not fly. And I think that's essentially what, what Dunn's point was. It's not so much that, that Paul is, is switching his mind and, and siding with the Jews, Judaizers as much as more of an arm around the shoulder, getting them to accept his initial point and then come in and, and have that point um, corrected. Now, Hun went through a couple other examples of where you find these same kind of partial exceptions. And, and it's interesting that, the, the, that these, the, the clauses that she talks about, the, the proposition, the instances, partial exceptions that she talks about are ones that are not simple, uh, simple propositions, meaning most exceptions, the, the, the clause that's being accepted is very simple. It doesn't contain caveats. It doesn't contain additional information. And that's what we have in Galatians uh, 2.16. We have a statement about, if we had said um, something like, um, a person is not justified um, except by faith in Christ, people would have had no problem with that. None whatsoever. And in fact, we find similar statements elsewhere. But what you find instead is this qualification about the people being justified, that it's those with works of the law. So if we go down and look at a couple of Hun's examples, we'll find that other places where she's um, appealing for a, a partial exception to occur, it's also in clauses where you find a caveat or some additional information that, that turns the restricted proposition from a simple statement to more of a complex one. So here in, in, in John uh, 5.19, uh, we have truly, truly, I say to you, um, the son can do nothing. And then we have um, of himself. And then we have except what he sees the father doing. Uh, this is one of those propositions where, again, logic from a logical standpoint, it makes it sound like the son is able to do certain things or to do other things, just not of himself. Um, but if we keep reading, let's actually just go over to... Um, So we have this statement in John 5, 19, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, uh, the son does nothing of himself except what he sees the father doing. And this, this creates the impression then, and what Hun is arguing is that this is not a correct statement because it makes it sound as though the son is doing other things. But what's interesting is she makes clear that Afheotu has been included for the sake of emphasis. And she's using emphasis in, in the, the less technical sense that, than, than what I do in terms of marked focus and P2. But her point is it's been included on purpose to draw attention to this facet of information, which is of himself, because what it does is it's pointing to um, not so much agency, but, but the origination of the things that he does. 
He only does what he sees the Father doing. And if we keep reading the, the next clause, um, we see that whatever that one does, meaning referring to the Father, the Son likewise does. So the point is, um, you've got a restatement here that Jesus is only doing what he sees the Father doing. Uh, and and that's, again, I, I believe done on purpose to uh, draw attention, not to agency in terms of what Jesus is doing or what, what he's able to do of himself as much as the origination of it. The other example is in John 15, 4, and we find a similar afheau tu, um, taking what would have been a simple statement and making it more complex. That just as the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself or from itself, um, except it remains in the vine, that makes it sound like there might be some other means by which um, the, the vine could bear fruit. Um, and and I've, I've not had the chance to look at all of Hun's examples, but the... Um, the ones that I've, I mean, I've looked at, I think Ada, I think she goes through about 10 different ones. Um, but, but the important point to see here is that um, she's um, looking at things that are um, not simple um, in, in the sense of they're not your normal uh, simple uh, propositions, except, but they've got additional caveats, additional information there. Well, at this point, that's um, the main thing I wanted to, to, to talk about in terms of the content um, and open it up. If you go to um, faithlife.com forward slash high def, you can go ahead and um, post any questions there uh, if you want. Um, the... The content I've covered is in is available in the or most of the content is in the discourse grammar of the Greek New Testament. Um, there's some of it in chapter two and some of it in chapter four, uh, particularly talking in, about the point counterpoint sets. Um, and for those of you who, who haven't seen um, the database, you've read the discourse grammar in print, but weren't aware of the database. Um, there is a, a database that marks up all of the features that are described in the, in the Greek discourse grammar. Um, and that comes with the Greek database, a glossary. So when you hover over something, you'll get a pop-up, but then there's also an introduction. So if you can right click on a word um, that has the markup, um, click on one of the, the discourse um, metadata labels, and then you can um, open up the glossary introduction uh, or doing a search on things. It also includes the high definition New Testament, which is a an, an ESV version of about 70% of the same data. And it also comes with the glossary and an introduction. And the idea is by working with both of these, especially if your Greek is rusty, um, you can use the logos feature of sympathetic highlighting to be able to quickly find uh, what you're looking for in one or the other. Um, and if you've invested the time in learning about the discourse features and that's something you want to use in a classroom, you can actually teach from the high definition New Testament and be able to help students um, uh, be able to engage um, discourse features um, that are basically obscured um, in, in many of the translations based on the value of providing a readable translation. Now, there's a question from Ryan asking about how, um, how it is that the, so let's go back to uh, Galatians 2.16. He's asking, how is it that the participle backgrounds thing, how do, uh, things, how does that impact um, the, the flow of thought? And if we look at how most translations render idotes, they're rendering it as though it's a main thought, uh, meaning that instead of verse 16 having one big idea, which is we also have believed in Christ, um, we you end up having two, which is, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law except or but by faith in Christ. And that's where 
the the use of but here makes aeon may sound much more like it's Allah that it's an instead that it's going back instead of this it's that and that's the effect of the the partial the partial acceptive my claim is that um, if we if we make it something less than a prototypical acceptive we're undermining the logic of Paul's argument here uh, because it's not a replacement he's he's left the door open on purpose from my standpoint um, and but by promoting the participle what that does is you end up with contradictory statements where the participle then is is basically setting the stage in essence let me paraphrase we all know that a person isn't justified by works of the law except by faith in Christ. So for the Judaizer who does believe that, that works in the law, works of the law, whether you take works of the law as um, uh, ceremonial observance of the law um, in, in kind of the, the new perspective sense, or whether you're taking works of the law in, in more of the traditional sense, um, that really doesn't matter. I mean, it, the, whatever that whatever works of the law means, Paul's point here is he's he's drawing this in as though it's shared knowledge, and this statement about um, we are Jews by nature and not from among the Gentile sinners certainly seems to be pandering, and, and most commentators take it as that. Um, but I think what's going on here is you have again the prioritization, and and you you end up with contradictory statements as you choose not to. Uh, respect the participle it ends up with two equal statements two main statements about we know this and we also have believed and that's where you end up with a contradictory statement then if you don't take it as a as a partial exception because on the one hand he's saying you know a person is is justified by works of the law um, when faith is present and we also have believed in order that we be justified by faith in Christ not by works of the law um, this is the importance of, uh, again, recognizing that mention of works of the law in 216a as being there to introduce a, a, a set of members, um, like in the, that it's to delineate one group of people as opposed to this other group of people that he gets that he that he goes on to talk about in the balance of the verse, and and it's only then in the balance of the verse that we learn that um, um, that the works of the law is essentially a red herring and doesn't play a meaningful role. Well, if there are others that, that have questions, uh, I'm going to go ahead and and in the the broadcast now, but go ahead and post those questions to. Um, if you go to faithlife.com forward slash high def, um, you'll see videos that I've done to answer users' questions. You'll find um, you'll find other videos. You'll, it's a place where you can post questions here about updates on new resources or discount codes. And as soon as I get done broadcasting this, I'm going to post a discount code for uh, a nine volume set that includes the Greek New Testament, you know, the, the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament, the High Definition New Testament, the Glossary and Introduction that co goes with it, the um, Discourse Grammar, the Greek New Testament, the Philippians, High Def Commentary, and a fresh shrift to my mentor, Stephen Levinson. So thank you for joining. Uh, and again, if you've got any questions, we'll just um, answer the, the balance of the questions offline.